Hello everyone and welcome to another wonderful day of chemistry. So today we're going to go ahead and look at ionic crystal structures. So really our major approach here is going to be starting with one of the crystal structures that we've seen before, usually one of our nice simple crystal, uh, cubic ones. These are a very good starting point. And then we have to realize that when I deal with ionic structures, the biggest difference is I have multiple different atoms. And these atoms want to stay away from themselves, but near the other species. So for example, if I'm looking at cesium chloride, cesium has to stay away from cesium, but nearby chloride. So this often works by either by doing one of two uh, key methods. Either I take an existing crystal structure and I simply replace one of the atoms. So for example, if I'm looking at cesium chloride, I can go ahead and say, start with a nice uh, body centered cubic. And then I'm going to replace the center atom with cesium and leaving uh, the corners as chloride. When you're doing this, you need to make sure to pay really close attention to make sure your charges are balanced. So if we go ahead and add, add up our atoms, we'll notice that we'll have one, chlor one net chloride and one net cesium. Charges end up getting to zero. Often when you're depicting these structures, it is very worth noting that in general, our cations tend to be smaller than our anions. However, you can get some exceptions. Cesium and chloride get pretty close because cesium is in the sixth row and chloride is in the third. But it is worth noting that still brings them to similar sizes. In general, what we can often do is use this fact that cations are smaller than anions to go ahead and figure out another way we can generate a structure. So we can go ahead and uh, start with a given structure. So for example, if I'm looking at sodium chloride, I can go ahead and start with a face-centered cubic structure and then realize I have these little holes along the edges. So what I can do is say, wait a minute, what if I put a sodium, which is relatively small, in each of these holes? That will make it so these chlorides can actually get closer and they'll be much more favorable. So it'll just barely break the chloride-chloride contact and again, help insulate all of those charges. So this really will end up helping stabilize the chloride. <clears throat> However, one of the other things you have to make sure you're doing when you're replacing one of these cells is making sure that you're choosing the right unit cell. So for example, you may say here, well, it would make sense if I just chose one of these small cells, like the one in the upper right, or the upper left here. But you may notice that if you did that, what would happen if you migrated it one to the right? Well, then, you'll notice that I'll have a sodium. Uh, sodium, when it moves over, would become a chlorine. That's not allowed. So in this case, we have to use this larger crystal cell to make sure that if I move up, right, left, essentially in the direction of any of the faces, I get the same cell back. And that's exactly what ends up happening here. However, one of the things that becomes very messy here is I have to make sure I know how many atoms are in a given lattice just to make sure my charges are balanced, as well as to understand things like closest neighbors and size. So, however, it gets a little messier when we're trying to count cells in an ionic lattice because we have uh, atoms in the center, on the faces, edges, and corners. So we can use a simple set of rules. Every atom in the corner, just like we did with simple cubic, counts as one eighth of an atom. Because you'll notice there is only about one eighth of the atom that points to the unit cell. The other seventh eighths go into the eight neighboring cells. Edges count as one quarter because this one atom is split among four cells evenly, one fourth. Uh, then when we go ahead and look at faces, uh, sides or faces, they count as a half, half on in one cell, half in the neighboring. And anybody who's clearly in the center, like the center sodium, counts as a full atom. So let's go ahead and uh, try our counting rules for this sodium chloride system. Let's start with sodium. Uh, first, you'll note that we have one atom that is clearly in the center. So we get one for free. Then we need to count up the, all the other atoms. You'll notice that all the other sodiums occur on edges. And we're going to have four, one, two, three, four on this top edge one, two, three, four in the middle, and four on the bottom. So this gives us 12 edge atoms, but we have to divide by four because they're dis well distributed. So this gives us a net of three atoms on the edges and one in the center. So this cell contains four sodium atoms. 
Now let's go ahead and look at those chlorines. So we have our good old fashioned face centered cubic, so we should end up getting four, but let's just double check. So we have eight corners, one atom in each, which means that we have eight divided by eight, there's one atom net in all the corners. Now faces, uh, now remember these count as one half. So we'll take our number divided by two and we're going to have six different faces, one in each of the six directions. Again, think like you're using a six sided die and it helps out. So we've got six atoms on the sides divide by two, that gives us a net of three atoms on the side inside our unit cell and one inside our unit cell on the corners. So that gives us a total of four. Now, one of the things you can do is you can use these same basic principles, but really end up scaling it up into increasingly complicated structures. So I'll go ahead and walk through a couple fun examples of how messy some of these systems can be. So let's go ahead and take a look at titanium oxide. So with titanium oxide, this time we're going to use titanium as our corner lattice. So what we have is titanium occupies a base uh, body centered cubic, one atom in the center, one on each corner, body centered. And oxygen, we have essentially uh, multiple oxygen, uh, two oxygens in the top <laughs> occupying holes, and then two in the center of the system. So now we have to go ahead and try and count these. This gets a little fun. So the titanium is relatively easy because we know the number for body centered. We have eight corners, one eighth each, and one in the center. So net of one in the corners, one in the center, gives us two titanium atoms. Oxygen, a little bit more fun. So we have two atoms wholly inside the unit cell. So that's two for free. Then we've got two on top, two on bottom, but notice that these are on the faces. So they count as half. So four divided by two. So we've got a net of two atoms inside and two on the faces. So when we add this up, we have two titanium atoms and four oxide uh, ions. So when doing this, do make sure that your charge is balanced. We should have a two to one ratio on titanium oxide. Titanium is plus four, oxygen is minus two. And indeed we have two titanium atoms, four oxides, we should be fine. Now let's go ahead and take a look at calcium fluoride which is a fun uh, species that often leaches fluoride into the environment and is a source of natural fluoridation of teeth. So we can go ahead and take a look at calcium. So in this case, <clears throat> what we can do is treat the calcium as a face centered cubic, because you'll notice we have one uh, calcium atom on each face and then one in the corners. So when we go ahead and add these up, it should be, uh, relatively straightforward because a face center cubic has a net of four, uh, four atoms, a net of three on the faces and one in the corners, so four total. Now let's go ahead and double check and see the fluorides. In this case, we get pretty lucky. Fluoride is exclusively on the inside as it's filling up this center hole. <clears throat> and this gives us four calcium ions and eight fluoride ions. And again, we've preserved this two to one ratio because fluoride has half the charge, so I need twice as many. So you can often start expanding into ever increasingly messy and large ionic structures. However, this is one of the ways we can describe a lot of the behaviors of many salts as you can generate a crystal structure for almost every salt you've seen. So as a result, ionic solids, very nicely behaved crystal systems, if a bit on the messy side. So next time, we're going to go ahead and see if we can use our old knowledge of thermodynamics to evaluate the stability of some of these ionic crystals. Until then, take care.